Hi, first of all, a very warm welcome to this course of programming. This course is mainly about learning the art of programming. And we will learn this concept using the tool or language known as Python. Now let's discuss what you can expect from this course. First, the programming is about problem solving. You are given some problem and you are supposed to break down the problem and come up with a step by step solution. And then these steps are translated into the programming language statements and finally combine these steps so as to have final solution. Therefore, programming is not just about learning the programming language. It is about to understand how to break down the problem, building the logical ability and reasoning. I have personally interviewed many candidates for the software engineer and even the technical leader position. Many of them had the knowledge in different domains. But as soon as we start discussing the basics, the problem starts surfacing. Therefore, this course is designed to learn the programming along with programming language. How we do so, we will discuss in the coming slide. For now, let me introduce myself. I am Gulshan and I will be your instructor for this course. I have worked for about 20 years in the field of software development and I have played different roles in this field. Now coming back to this course, this course will teach you the functional programming along with the examples and practical exercises so as to build a thorough understanding. It will also introduce you to the world of object oriented programming. And we will also discuss different algorithms as we go through different examples and exercises. Another important point is that you may not find the content of this course in a conventional way. This course is designed to go step by step. Most of the programming concepts are based upon one another. Therefore, we have tried to cover the basics first. And once we understand them, once we come up to a level of understanding, then only we jump to the next step. Then we discuss the next concept. This course is not about just to tell you about the concepts. It is about experiencing these concepts. Some part of a particular concept may be skipped initially, which we do not seem relevant at that point in time. And we can come back to that later in this course. And in the last, it is very important to mention that this course is not a static course. We will keep on adding new concepts and features in this course so as to make it more thorough and relevant. Now let's discuss why we should learn Python to learn programming. A few reasons are there. First, Python gets us to the speed very quickly. As you will learn, you just need to specify what to achieve rather than how to achieve it. If you are coming from some other programming language domain, say Java, you may have realized that you need to specify a function and a static array of string that is arguments just to say hello world. In Python, it is not at all necessary. Second, Python is very easy to learn and it tries to go very close to the English language sometimes, as you will see this in the coming chapters. Third, Learning Python, it opens the doors to many fields for you. For example, data science, web development, desktop application development. Now coming to the pedagogy approach taken in this course. First, we present a programming concept to you. Then we discuss some examples around that concept. And after that, you are presented some relevant programming exercises. Although the solution of these exercises are also given to you, but we strongly recommend that you solve these exercises yourself before watching the solution videos. An art, including programming, cannot be learned unless we practice it ourselves. 
we need to get our hands dirty therefore we suggest you to watch the solution only after you have solved these problems yourself and we also suggest you to watch the solution videos even if you have solved the problems yourself why the reason being that some programming tips and tricks some programming conventions some of my experiences are discussed in these example and exercise solution videos therefore you may get some new and important information in these videos as well as this point is very important so let me say it once more i highly recommend you to solve the exercises before moving on to the next chapter if you are really interested in learning the programming and secondly please do watch the solution videos even if you have solved the exercises yourself so what to wait for let's dive in and get started welcome back in this video we will install python on our machine for installing python just open this link in your browser python.org/downloads the link is given to you as reference material of this chapter from this page we just need to download the python as per our machine platform in my case it is windows so let me install it you may see a different version depending on your machine operating system and the time when you are watching this video as of the recording day of this video i am getting python version 392 you may get a newer version here just make sure that you are getting python 3.x.x now let me click this button download now as you can see that the python downloading has started now as the python has been downloaded we can simply install it let's click here to start the installation now we need to click here on the install now it will install python 3.9.2 on our machine including the pip and its documentation as well just make sure that you are checking this particular checkbox that we need to add the python 3.9 to our path so let me check it and then we say install now okay just press yes here now the setup is complete okay so i am closing it here and now to verify the python installation we just need to open the command prompt and see whether python is working there or not so let me open the command prompt now on the command prompt just type python now just notice the change in the prompt you are getting the python prompt and you can notice that it is displaying the python version python 3.9.2 if you are getting this prompt then python has been successfully installed on your machine we can just try out one python command on this prompt just say print hello type in print and then in parenthesis just say hello and we get the output hello with this we have verified the successful installation of python on our machine to come out of the python prompt just say quit and parenthesis and press enter now we have come back to our original command prompt in case of any problem or any query regarding the installation of python on your machine you can raise it in the q and a section on the portal this was our first step in getting our environment set up let's meet in the next video thank you welcome back in this chapter we are going to install an integrated development environment for python on our machine 
we will use this in our projects to create the Python files. This is a sophisticated editor which is very useful in creating the Python projects. It is being widely used in the industry as well. For this, just search for PyCharm on your browser. The very first link which you will get is from JetBrains. So just follow this link and on this page you will see this download button. Just click it. Now on this page you can see that PyCharm comes in two versions. One is professional version and the second one is community version. Professional version of course gives you more support and more advanced tools. However, for our projects, we will use the community version which is free and meets our requirement. So just download the community version on your machine. Now as you see that the community version download has started on my machine. And it's a big file, it will take some time to download. So we will come back once the download completes. Now the download has completed, so I am just starting the installation process. Now let's click next to continue. You can select the destination folder for the installation of PyCharm. I am just moving ahead with the default settings. Now on this page it is asking for some configuration. A few things to notice here. First is to make sure to include the launch directory to the path environment variable. And second is to create the association of .py files to PyCharm. It is done to open the .py files directly into PyCharm editor. Just make sure these two checkboxes are checked and say next. Now we need to press the install button. Now it is installing PyCharm on our machine. Now PyCharm has been installed on our machine. To finish the installation, we need to reboot our machine. So just say reboot now and press this finish button. It will reboot your machine and finalize the PyCharm installation. In the next video, we will write the hello world program again using the PyCharm editor. So with this, thank you for your time in this chapter. See you in the next one. Welcome back. Now we have already installed PyCharm on our machine. Next we will configure this IDE and we will write our first program in it. So just open the PyCharm editor on your machine. I have already installed PyCharm on my machine and I have just opened it. When you open PyCharm on your machine first time, it may ask you to import some configurations. At that step, as you did not have any previous installations of PyCharm, so just say no, you do not want to import any setting. Next, it may ask you to choose a theme. You have two options here, dark theme or light theme. Just select the one as per your preference and move to the next step. After that, it may also ask you to select some plugin. PyCharm provides some certain plugins that help in working with different other tools. As of now, we do not need any, so we just start using PyCharm without any plugin. And PyCharm also gives some tips about its own usage. If you are new to PyCharm, you may go through these tips. As of now, we are just moving ahead to create the new project. And after that, PyCharm will ask you to create a project. So you will see a window something like this where you can select the location of your new project. So just select any location on your hard drive as per your choice and then say create. Before hitting this create button just make sure that this particular checkbox is checked. That to create a main.py file with a welcome script. Right. So just hit this create button. Now it is creating the new project. And when this new project is opened, you will see some default content in the main.py file. If you notice here, main.py file is selected and it is coming with some default content. We will explain this default content when we understand the Python to some extent. As of now, I am just deleting this default content 
and putting in some simple content. So let me delete it. Now I'm adding a simple print statement in this file. So just say print hello. So this is our simple program where we are just saying hello. The next step we need to save this particular file. For saving it, you just need to press this file and you can press this save all or alternatively you can use this shortcut of control S. So let us use the shortcut. I am pressing control S to save the file and after that we can now run the file. For running the file you just use this play button. If you notice here this play button is there. So just press this play button and you will get the output window where you can see the hello is coming. So we asked python to print hello and it is saying hello here. Now let us add a few more print statements. Okay, so now we have added a few more print statements. Just make sure that you do not have any space or indentation before the first character on any line. Okay, and after that you just again save the file and run it. So press Ctrl S and then press this play button. And now you can see the output has changed to hello followed by one, two, and then welcome to the course of programming. If you notice, there was a blank line after this print hello here, which has been ignored by Python and no action has been taken corresponding to this blank line. It is just printing what it has been asked to in different print statements. So it is printing hello one, two, and welcome to the course of programming. If you are getting this output, you have successfully installed PyCharm integrated development environment on your machine and our setup is ready now to work with the next set of programs in the next chapters. So with this, thank you for your time in this chapter. See you in the next one. Thank you.
वेलकम बैक इन दिस चैप्टर वी विल डिस्कस द कंसेप्ट ऑफ इंटीजर वेरिएबल्स सपोज यू वॉन्ट टू यूज अ वैल्यू इन योर प्रोग्राम वन वे टू स्टोर दिस वैल्यू इज इन वेरिएबल्स एनी वैल्यू यू वॉन्ट टू यूज इट गेट्स स्टोर्ड इन टू अ मेमरी द स्क्वेयर ब्लॉक शोन इन दिस डायग्राम रिप्रेजेंट्स द मेमरी एंड द वैल्यू स्टोर्ड इन दिस ब्लॉक इज फाइव Now this memory block is represented by a label. In our example the label is a. In other words we can say that the variable a is having the value 5. Now how to define the variables in python? The syntax is very simple. You just need one statement say variable name then equal sign and then the value or expression This equal sign is the assignment operator in Python. For example, we have the statements k equal to four, j equal to five, c equal to three, my where is equal to two, count equal to five. These are all assignment statements, and in all these statements, we have the variable on the left hand side of the assignment operator. and the value on the right hand side of this operator secondly in all these examples we are assigning an integer value to the variable so these all are integer variables and more specifically these variables are known as identifiers if we want to check the type of a variable we can do it very easily just say print and then in the print you say type and then in the type you just say the variable name and then just close the parenthesis it will tell you what is the type of the given variable is in our case because k is integer variable so it will say class int that is k is of type integer before we move on to the examples of variables there are certain rules regarding the naming of the variable or identifiers we need to understand that first so let's quickly go through them so that we do not make any mistake about them when we are writing the programs first rule is that the first letter of the variable or identifier name should be a character it can be a lower case or upper case character second the variable or identifier name can start with an underscore as well and the third rule says the variable or identifier names are case sensitive because these are case sensitive so all these variables which are given here they are all different because in first case you see that all the letters are upper case in the second example m is upper case in the third example m and v are upper case in the fourth example this v is upper case and in the fifth example this m is upper case although this second example and fifth example are exactly same so these are not different however other variables are all different so it is important to remember that the variable names are case sensitive in python and finally there are certain keywords already reserved in python we will learn about these keywords as well as we proceed in this course our variables or identifiers cannot use these keywords so just remember that all right so so far we have assigned only a value to the variables now it is possible to assign the result of an expression to the variable as well for example if we have two variables x and y then we can calculate the sum of x and y using the operator plus and assign the result of this expression to another variable let us say t so if x has the value 3 and y has the value 5 then t will get the value 8 that is 3 plus 
in the first case. Similarly, we can calculate the difference of two variables using the operator minus. In this case, if x is 5 and y is 4, then the t will get the value 5 minus 4, that is 1. On the same lines, star is the multiplication operator. If x is 5 and y is 4, then t will get the value 20. And next, we have this slash operator and this is the division operator. In this case, if x is 5 and y is 2, then t will get the value 2.5. The important point to note here is that the expression will always result into a float value. For example, if x is 4 and y is 2, then the result of x slash y will be 2.0 and not 2. That is, the result will always be with a decimal point. So t will get the value 2.0 and it will be a float variable, not an integer variable. If we are just interested only in the integer part of the division and we are not interested about the fractional part, in that case we can use the operator slash slash double slash. In this case, if x is 4 and y is 2, then t will get the value 2 and t will be an integer variable. Similarly, if x is 5 and y is 2, then also t will get the value 2 since 5 slash 2 is equal to 2.5 and 0.5 will be ignored by this double slash operator. So t will get the value 2 and it will remain an integer variable. Next, if we want to get the remainder value of a division operation, then we can use the operator percentage. In this case, if x is 5 and y is 2, and we know that if 5 is divided by 2, then the remainder is 1. So t will get the value 1. Next operator is this power operator double star. In this case, if x is 5 and y is 2, then the t will get 25, that is 5 raised to the power 2, that is 5 into 5. So t will get the value 25. And next operator is this minus operator. This is an unary operator. All the above operator required two operands. So they were all binary operators. The unary operator just requires only one operand. And this unary minus operator, it just changes the sign of the operand. In this case, if x is 5, then t will get the value minus 5. If x is minus 5, then t will get the value 5. And please note that in any of the above operation, the value of the operands on the right hand side of the assignment operator do not get affected. The x and y will keep their original values after such operands are done. So after all these statements, x and y will just keep their original values. Only the variables on the left hand side of the operator, they will get the resultant value of the expression. Right? Now coming to the last operator that is unary plus, actually it does not do anything. It just assigns the value of x to the t. So if x is 5, t gets 5. If x is minus 5, t also gets minus 5. Now enough of theory. Let's get to the examples in the next chapter. Thank you. Welcome back. Now let's discuss some examples to understand the integers better. We will try to understand all the concepts which we discussed in the last chapters. The first concept was related to the type of the variable, how to check the type. So for example, let's say we have a variable k. It is an integer variable having an integer value. Say k is equal to 4. And if we want to check the type of this particular variable, we need to say print and then type and then k. Right? Let's try to run this. 
now we can see here it is saying class int that means this particular variable k is of type integer right now let's discuss the addition operator before that we need to comment out this particular part of the program for commenting out any lines you just need to select the lines and press control forward slash it will comment out all the selected lines now let's take two variables say x and y let's say x is equal to 5 and y is equal to 3 and then we can say z is equal to x plus y and after that we just need to print z we know x is equal to 5 y is equal to 3 so the value of z should be 8 right let's try to run this and we can see here the output is 8 alternative way of printing the result of the addition is something like this say print and directly you can say print x plus y now let's comment out this particular line and now if you run the program you see that the result is still 8 so one way is that you assign the result to a variable and print it or alternatively directly print the result of the expression print x plus y on the same lines we can calculate the subtraction result say print x minus y let me comment this and now we can print the subtraction result we see the output is 2 because x is 5 y is 3 so 5 minus 3 is equal to 2 and we are getting the 2 here next operator is the multiplication operator so we can say print x star y again let's run the program and we can see the output is now 15 5 into 3 is 15 so output is coming as 15 so this is also fine now let me comment out the whole part let me clean out rather this now let's say we have a variable u is equal to 15 and v is 3 and now let's say w is equal to u divided by v okay so 15 divided by 3 should be 5 let's try to print w now let's run this program and we can see that the w value is 5.0 as we discussed the output of division operator is always float that is why w is getting the value 5.0 so w is a float variable not an integer variable right if you are interested only in getting the integer portion of the division operator then what we need to do is we need to use the double slash operator instead of single slash so let's try out that as well so i'm changing this operator to double slash now the w value will be u double slash v u is 15 v is 3 so w should get integer 5 not 5.0 right so let's try to run this program as well and we can see here now this time it is simply saying 5 not 5.0 so for this time w is an integer variable because it got an integer value right now the next operator is the power operator or double star operator for this let me change the value of u to let's say 5 and v to 2 and now we say that w is equal to u star star v so 5 raised to the power 2 is 25 5 into 5 is 25 so w value should be 25 let's try to run this and we can see the output is 25 and if we change the value of v to 3 then the result should change to 125 because 5 into 5 into 5 is 125 
let's try to run this and we can see the output is 125 so that is how this power operator is working the next operator was the unary operator that is minus unary operator let's use that one as well now let's say w is equal to minus u okay now because u is 5 so the value w should get is minus 5 let's verify that and we can see the output is minus 5 right and the next operator was the unary plus now let's say w is equal to plus v okay now v is 3 so w should also get the same value as v that is 3 so in this case the output of this particular program should be 3 let's try to run this program and we can see that the value of w is 3 and now let's come to the next operator that is um, modulus operator for getting the remainder of a division for this let us change the value of u to 15 and now v is let's say 2 and we say w is equal to u percentage v right and when we divide 15 by 2 the remainder should be 1 so the w variable should get the value 1 let's try to run this program as well and we see that now w has got the value 1 right that is how the operator works on all the integer variables with this thank you for your time in this chapter see you in the next one thank you welcome back now let's discuss the answers to the integer exercises let's take the first one the first exercise is that we are given the scores of three players in a match player one scored let's say 75 player two scored 80 player three scored 60 we need to write a program that prints the total score of three players and the average score of three players here we can take three variables let's say player one player two player three and assign these values 75 80 and 60 for calculating the total score of three players what we can do is we can take another variable let's say total and just sum up the value of these three players player one plus player two plus player three and assign the result back to the total and after that we can print the total score for this we are saying in double quotes total score equal to a string and then comma total so just to make this output informative we are using this kind of print statement where we are adding this particular string as well and then for calculating the average what we need to do is just divide the total score by 3 because the total number of players are 3 so average is equal to total divided by 3 and after that we can print the average score as well right so let's try to run this program and we see that the total score is coming out as 215 because 75 plus 80 plus 60 is 215 and the average score is 71.66 that is 215 divided by 3 is 71.66 right so that is how we calculate the total score and average score of three players so this is about the functionality of the program However, before we move on to the next chapter, there are a few important points here which we need to note down. The first is, as you see here, I have used the spaces on either side of the operator in every statement, be it comma operator, be it plus operator, be it assignment operator, be it division operator. I have always used a space on either side of the operator this space actually enhances the readability of the program so readability aspect is also very important and we need to take care of that second is i have not used any cryptic variable name like x y z or u v as we have discussed in the examples rather when we are solving the actual problem in that case we need to use some meaningful variable names 
In this case, I have used the variable names as player1, player2, player3, which are clearly in accordance to the given requirement statement. We were given the score of three players. That is why I have taken the variable names like player1, player2, and player3. For calculating the total also, this particular variable name is making sense because it is containing the sum of the all three player scores. For calculating the average, the variable name was also chosen accordingly. So whenever you are selecting your variable name, just keep attention that it is meaningful, it is representing the part of the solution appropriately. And third thing is, if you want to comment out any piece of the program, you can just say control plus forward slash, right? So let's say if I want to comment out this particular piece, then I just need to select it and then say control slash and uh, it will comment out the selected lines. If I want to remove the comments from these lines, again, I need to press control plus forward slash and all the comments part of these particular statements will be removed and they will become the normal statements. And finally, there is one more important point that if you notice, I have used some blank lines here. One blank line is here and one blank line is here as well. It is to segregate three different parts of the program because here if you see, the first part is to get the input scores of three players. And in the second part, we are calculating the total and printing them. And in the third part, we are calculating the average and printing them. So clearly there were three parts of the program. So just by adding these two blank lines, we have separated these three parts. As we write something in English, then we do not keep on writing everything in one paragraph, right? One set of related information we put in one para and after that we start second para and then so on. Similarly, when you are writing the program, you need to be very clear where you are getting a logical break in your solution. And accordingly, you can put some blank lines. This also enhances the readability of your program. I'm stressing upon on these points right in the beginning of this particular course. It is due to the reason that often we focus only on the solution part of the given problem. We neglect the readability part of our solution. Whereas if you are writing some industry standard program, where it has to be maintainable for a long time, it is very important that your solution is very much readable as well. So always keep focus on the readability part, give the importance to the readability as much as you are giving the importance to the functionality or logic of your solution. So with this, thank you for your time in this chapter. See you in the next one. Thank you. Welcome back. Now let's discuss the solution to the second exercise. And here the problem statement is something like this, that we are given a bag having balls of different colors. Let's say there are five black balls, three white balls and two green balls. And after that, one ball is selected from the bag at random. We need to write a program that calculates the probability of different balls getting selected. So let's start. We have balls of three colors, let's say black, white and green. And we are given that black balls are five, white balls are three and green are two. For calculating the probability, first of all, we need to calculate how many total number of balls are there in the bag. So for this, I'm having one variable total and just sum up all these three variables in this particular variable. Let's say total equal to black plus white plus green. So once we have calculated the total in this particular variable, now we can calculate the probability of black ball getting selected or white ball or green ball. Let's say the probability of black ball is denoted by this particular variable P black. So the formula is that number of black balls divided by total number of balls. So black by total. Similarly, the probability of white ball will be P white, which is white by total and the probability of green ball will be equal to green divided by total. And after that, we can simply print these three probabilities which we have calculated here. So I've added these three print statements. Now let's try to run this program. Before that, let's save it, say control S. 
and then press this play button to run the program and we can see that the probability of black ball is 0.5 probability of white ball is 0.3 and probability of green ball is 0.2 total number of balls were 10 black balls were 5 so 5 divided by 10 is 0.5 that is why we see here probability of black ball is equal to 0 0.5 on the same lines the probability of white ball is 0 0.3 and for green ball it is 0 0.2 right so with this, thank you for your time in this chapter. See you in the next one. Thank you. Welcome back. Now it is the time to deep dive into the concept of variables and learn some advanced topics. Let us start with an example. Suppose we have these statements in our program where a is equal to 7 and b is equal to a. And then we say print b. What will be the output of this program? Take a moment. Pause the video and come back with the result. Do not run it as of now. The output of this program will be 7 because the variable b gets the value of a which is 7. So far so good. Now let's try to understand how it happened. First we said a is equal to 7. So the variable a started pointing to a memory block having value 7 right after that when we said b is equal to a a new variable b got defined which also started pointing to the same memory block as that of a therefore when we said print b it printed the value of same memory block which was 7 so the output we got is 7 okay now we change the program slightly let us say a is equal to 7, b is equal to a and after that we say a is equal to 5 and then we say print b. Now what should be the output of the program? Again, pause the video, think about it and come back with your result. Just don't run it as of now. Now if your answer is 5, then I am sorry. The answer is not correct. The correct answer is 7. Why? Let's try to understand that. As per our current understanding, A and B are pointing to the same memory block. So when we change the value of A to 5, the value of B should also change to 5, right? But it does not happen that way. Let's understand this. As long as only the first two statements got executed, that is a is equal to 7 and b is equal to a, the variable a and b were pointing to the same memory block. However, as soon as we said a is equal to 5, that is we change the value of a, then a left behind the old memory block and a new memory block was allocated with value 5 and variable a started pointing to the new memory block. However, the variable b was still pointing to the old memory block. Therefore, when we said print b, we got the result 7 and not 5. Right? So, this discussion leads to two important aspects in Python which we will discuss next. The first concept is that the integers are immutable. By immutability, we mean that once an integer variable is assigned some value, it cannot be modified. It does not mean the value of the variable cannot be changed. It just means that the value contained in the memory block to which the variable is pointing to, it cannot be modified. Do not worry if it is not clear as of now. Let's try to understand it using an example. So consider this statement a is equal to 7. So for this, the variable a is pointing to a memory block containing value 7. Now let us say we change the value of a to 5. As soon as this statement gets executed, the variable a, it starts pointing to the new memory block containing value 5. So as you noticed here, the memory block with value 7 was not updated for new value 5. Rather, a new memory block was allocated with the value 5 and the variable a started pointing to this. 
This is the immutability property of integer variables. And this property is applicable to float and boolean variables as well, which we will discuss in the upcoming chapters. And there is one other important point here as well. When we said a is equal to 5, what happened to the memory block containing value 7? Actually, it got freed. Since this particular memory block was not being referenced by any particular variable, it got free. Since it got freed, it became a candidate to be collected by garbage collector. Garbage collector keeps on running in Python and it collects all the free spaces. Because this particular 7, this particular memory block was free, so it is collected by a garbage collector. Now coming to the next concept. So far we discussed the integer variables having decimal values. However, as we know that in computers, everything is in binary that is containing zeros and ones. So the integer values are actually stored in binary formats. It is just that they are being displayed in the decimal format. Python provides a few functions to convert a number into different formats that is binary, hexadecimal and octal formats. Python also provides one function to extract an integer value if it is in string. We will study string data type in the later chapters of this course. The function name through which we extract the integer value from string is actually int. We will study this function also in our later chapters. So with this, Thank you for your time in this chapter. Thank you. Welcome back. Now let's discuss the solution of our first exercise. And the exercise is to write a program to swap the value of two integer variables. Let's say two integer variables are var1 and var2 and we are assuming the values are 5 and 3. For swapping the value of two integer variables, what we can do is we can take a temporary variable, let's say temp var and assign the value of var1 into this. So once this particular statement is executed, the value of temp var will become 5 because the value of var1 is 5, right? So after this statement, var1 will be 5, var2 will be 3 and temp var will be 5, right? After that, we execute the statement var1 is equal to var2. Basically, we are assigning the value of variable 2 into variable 1. Why we are doing so? We are modifying the value of variable 1 because we have already stored the original value of variable 1 into temporary variable. So whenever we want the original value of variable 1, we can get it from the temporary variable. So now we are in a position where we can change the value of variable 1, right? So once this particular statement is executed, the value of variable 1 will become 3 and uh, variable 2 will keep its original value because it is on the right hand side of the expression. And then the temporary variable will remain unchanged. It is still 5, right? And now what we can do is now we can assign the original value of variable 1 into variable 2 and we know that the original value of variable 1 is in the temporary variable. That is why we are saying assign the value of temporary variable into variable 2. So once this statement is executed, the value of variable 1 will remain unchanged as before it is 3. Variable 2 now will get the value 5 which is there in the temporary variable and temporary variable will keep its value 5. Right? So as we see that now the value of variable 1 and variable 2 have interchanged. Variable 1 has got the value 3 whereas the variable 2 has got the value 5. And after that we are just simply printing the value of variable 1 and variable 2. Let's try to run this program. And we can see that it is saying 3 and 5, whereas the original value of variable 1 and variable 2 were 5 and 3. So the values of these two variables have been swapped. Right? So with this, thank you for your time in this chapter. Welcome back. 
Now let's discuss the solution of second exercise where we need to write a program to swap the value of two integer variables but this time we are not allowed to use any third variable. So let's say two variables are var1 and var2 values being 5 and 3. In the last exercise we used a temporary variable to store the original value of var1. Now because we are not allowed to use any third variable, any temporary variable, so what we can do is we can store the sum of these two variables values into var1. So what we are saying is var1 is equal to var1 plus var2. So after this particular statement is executed, the new value of variable 1 will be 8 and var2 will keep its original value that is 3. So here if you notice, now the variable 1 is actually having both the values that is the value of variable 1 as well as the value of variable 2 it is just having the total of these two we now in the variable 2 we get we need to get the original value of variable 1 how to get the original value of variable 1 that is to calculate the difference of the variable 2 from the total if we do this then the variable 2 will get the original value of variable 1 that is why we are saying var1 minus var2 and after this statement is executed the new value of variable 1 will remain same as before that is 8 and variable 2 will now change to 5 right now variable 2 has got the original value of variable 1 and on the same lines if we calculate the difference of var1 and var2 then the var1 will get the original value of var2 because now the current value of var2 is 5 whereas the original value of var2 was 3. So if we calculate the difference of 8 minus 5 then variable 1 will get the original value of var2 that is 3. So after this statement is executed the variable 1 is going to get the value 3 and variable 2 will keep the value as before that is 5. So if you see here the original values of var1 and var2 were 5 and 3 and now the variable 1 and variable 2 value have been swapped and they have become 3 and 5. And after that we are just having one print statement to confirm the output of this program. So let's try to run this. And we can see here the output is coming as 3 and 5 whereas the original values are 5 and 3. I hope now this particular logic is clear to you. With this, thank you for your time in this chapter. See you in the next one. Thank you. Welcome back. In this chapter, we will discuss the floating point variables. In the last chapter, we discussed that the variables which store integers are called integer variables. On the same lines, the variables which store the numbers having decimal part or fractional part, they are called floating point variables. Let us consider these examples. The first one is that the variable x is being assigned the value 5.3. It is having a number with decimal point so it is called a floating point variable. Similarly we have the variables y which is equal to 3.55 and z which is equal to 6.6667. All these variables are floating point variables as they are having floating point numbers. Next we have some operators which are applicable to the floating point variables and these are addition, subtraction, multiplication and division operators. Assuming that we have two variables x and y having values 3.5 and 2.0, the result of the operation x plus y will be equal to 5.5, x minus y is equal to 1.5, 3.5 1 .5 minus 2.0 is 1.5, x multiplied by y is equal to 7.0 because 3.5 multiplied by 2.0 is 7.0 and on the same lines x slash y will be equal to 1.75. Coming to the next point, it says that the operations involving integer and floating point variables are also allowed in Python. It is called the mixed mode arithmetic. In case of mixed mode arithmetic, the result of the operation will always be a floating point number. Here we are assuming that we have variable k is equal to 3 and y is equal to 3.5.
देन के स्टार वाई के मल्टीप्लाइड बाई वाई इज इक्वल टू टेन पॉइंट फाइव के प्लस वाई विल बी इक्वल टू सिक्स पॉइंट फाइव बिकॉज थ्री प्लस थ्री पॉइंट फाइव इज सिक्स पॉइंट फाइव एंड वाई माइनस टू पॉइंट फाइव विल बी इक्वल टू वन पॉइंट जीरो इफ यू नोटिस ऑल दो द वैल्यू ऑफ वाई माइनस टू पॉइंट फाइव इज वन बट द रिजल्ट इज कैलकुलेटेड एज वन पॉइंट जीरो सिंस द रिजल्ट हैज टू बी अ फ्लोटिंग पॉइंट नंबर सो दीज आर ऑल सम बेसिक कंसेप्ट रिलेटेड टू द फ्लोटिंग पॉइंट वेरिएबल्स Thank you for your time in this chapter. Thank you. Welcome back. Now let us consider the solution of our first exercise. And the problem statement is that we are given the length and width of the rectangle which is equal to 3.5 and 2.5. We need to write a program to calculate its area. So let us say we have two variables to store the length and width of the rectangle. Length is equal to 3.5, width is equal to 2.5. and next we can simply calculate the area which is equal to length into width so we have another variable for area and after that we are just having one print statement for displaying the area of rectangle the calculated area right so now let us try to run this program and we see here the area of rectangle is being calculated as 8.75 3.5 and 2.5 if they are multiplied the result will be 8.75 so this is a very simple example thank you for your time in this chapter see you in the next one thank you welcome back now let us discuss the next exercise of the floating point variable and here the problem statement is that a person covers following distances in the given time intervals and we need to calculate his average speed So we are having three variables: dist one, dist two, dist three to mark the distances covered in three separate hours, and the distances are thirty point five, twenty five point three, and twenty point two. For calculating the average speed, first of all, we need to calculate the total distance covered. So for this, we are having one variable, total dist. In this particular variable, total dist, what we are doing is we are adding up dist one, dist two, and dist three. and once we have the total distance covered we can easily calculate the average speed by just dividing the total dist by 3 and we are storing the result in a separate variable which is average speed and after that we are simply printing this average speed right so let us try to run this program and we see here the average speed is coming out to be 25.33 so again this is a very simple program with this Thank you for your time in this chapter. Thank you.
Welcome back. In this chapter, we will discuss the Boolean variables and the logical operators. The Boolean variables store the Boolean values and the Boolean values are true and false. We can guess from these values that the Boolean variables are used to store the result of some comparison. We will see this in the further slides. However, before that, it is important to know that in case of older version of Python and in some other programming languages, the integer 0 is considered as false and any other value is considered as true. So as we discussed, the Boolean variables are used to store the result of some comparison. In a programming language, the comparisons are done using the logical operators. Let us discuss some logical operators. Let us assume that x, y and z are three variables having value 1, 2 and 2 respectively. In the first logical operator that is less than, the first operand is x which is on the left hand side of the operator and the second operand is y which is on the right hand side of the operator. The less than operator returns true if the first operand that is x is less than the second operand that is y. In our example, since x is 1 and y is 2 and 1 is less than 2, so this operator returns true. Hence the variable result gets the value true. Result is a boolean variable here. When we print this variable, we get true. Alternatively, we can directly print the result of expression x less than y. The next logical operator is greater than operator and it returns true if the first operand is greater than the second operand. In our example, this expression returns true if x is greater than y. However, in our case x is 1 and y is 2, so x is smaller than 2. Therefore, this particular expression returns false, hence we get false here. The next logical operator is the equality operator and it is denoted by two equal signs. It also accepts two operands and it returns true if both the operands have the same values. Otherwise, it returns false. In our case, x and y are having different values. So the operator x double equal y returns false. However, if we compare y and z for the equality, it returns true since y and z have exactly the same value that is 2. The next logical operator is less than equal to. It also accepts two operands and it returns true if the first operand that is x is less than or equal to the value of second operand that is y. In our example x is 1 and y is 2. So the operator less than equal to returns true since 1 is less than 2. On the same lines the operator greater than equal to returns true if the first operand that is x is greater than or equal to y. In our case 1 is not greater than or equal to 2 so that is why this particular expression returns false. However, if we reverse the position of x and y as shown in the next example, this operator returns true since y that is 2 is greater than x which is 1. And it is also important to know that the logical operators discussed so far, they work on the floating point operands as well. Another important point to note here is that the equality operator may not work properly on the floating point variables as we discussed in the previous chapters as well. For more details, please refer to the chapter on the floating point variables advanced concepts. Okay, so so far we discussed the operators which work on the numerical values and they return boolean value. Now let us discuss the operators which work on the boolean values. Let us assume x is 1 and y is 2. Now let us say b1 is the result of 
x less than y so b1 will get the value true and b2 is the result of x greater than y so b2 is false since 1 is not greater than 2. Now the first operator which we discuss here is the AND operator. It also accepts two operands in this case b1 and b2. For this discussion let us assume that the operands are the boolean variables. The AND operator returns true only if both the operands are true. Otherwise it returns false. In our case b1 is true and b2 is false. So that is why this expression is false. In the next example since b1 is true and second operand is also b1 which is also true. So this particular expression will return true. The next operator is the OR operator. This operator returns true if at least one of the operand is true. In our case b1 is true. So that is why the result of this particular expression will be true. And on the same lines if we consider this expression in this case both the operands are false because b2 is false. So that is why the result of this expression is false. And finally we have the NOT operator which is a unary operator. It takes only one operand. It returns true if the operand value is false. If the operand value is true then it returns false. So basically it negates the operand value. Okay. So so far we discussed these operands AND, OR and NOT in the boolean context where we assume that the operands are the boolean variables. Next we will discuss these operators in the integer context where the operands are some integer values. So this is the boolean context of boolean operators discussed so far. Now let us see how these operators behave in the integer context that is when the operands are the integer values. Let us say we have three variables x, y, z the value being 1, 2 and 0. And as we discussed in python 0 is considered as false and any other value is considered as true. Secondly as we know that the AND operator returns true in the boolean context if all of its operands are true. right? Since the AND operator returns true if and only if all of its operands are true. It has to evaluate or check each and every operand. Now going by this the AND operator returns the value of last so called true operand in the integer context. In the first example the AND operator checks the value of x which is 1 so it is assumed to be true. Since the first operand is true it checks the value of second operand which is y. y is equal to 2 so it is also assumed to be true. The last operator which AND operator evaluated is y which is 2. So that is why the result of this expression is 2 that is the value of the last operand. Similarly when we say y and x the last operand that gets evaluated is x and the value of x is 1 so the result is 1. Now let us take the next example. In this case the value of z is 0 which is considered as false. As soon as the AND operator checks z it considers it as false. So the AND operator need not evaluate the second operator and it returns the value of z which is 0. On the same lines the OR operator works. In the boolean context OR operator returns true if any of its operand is true. In the integer context it returns the value of integer operand as soon as it checks a non-zero operand. Therefore in the first example x or y it returns the value of x since x is 1 which is non-zero. In the second example y or x here it should be y or x. 
इन द सेकेंड एग्जाम्पल वाई और एक्स इट रिटर्न द वैल्यू ऑफ वाई सिंस वाई इज टू विच इज ऑल्सो नॉन जीरो इन द थर्ड एग्जाम्पल जी और एक्स इट रिटर्न द वैल्यू ऑफ एक्स सिंस जी इज जीरो द ऑपरेटर हैज टू चेक द वैल्यू ऑफ एक्स एंड एज एक्स इज नॉन जीरो सो इट रिटर्न द वैल्यू ऑफ एक्स सो दिस इज हाउ द बुलियन ऑपरेटर्स वर्क इन द इंटीजर कॉन्टेक्सट to summarize in this chapter we discussed the boolean variables which can take the boolean values we discussed the logical operators which work on the numerical values do the comparisons and return the boolean values we also discussed about the operators and or and not in the boolean context and finally we discussed about the operators and and or in the integer context with this thank you for your time in this chapter thank you hi in this chapter we will discuss how to write meaningful comments and how to avoid the unnecessary or bad comments in our code one school of thought is that we should not have any comments in our code our code should be so beautiful that it can explain itself however this level of coding requires a lot of maturity and it comes with time when we are at the beginner stage comments can be of help to us as we will see in the later slides and sometimes comments are the necessary evils we have to put them in the code as they are very much required we will see these examples as well consider this function it is a simple function to check if the given number is a prime number or not assume that someone has written this code and he goes for a code review during the code review he gets the review observation that his code is not having any comments so he goes back and comes up with the next version of his code as this one now in this function as you can see he has simply added a comment before each line explaining what the next line is doing such comments are useless comments why these are useless as they are not helping the reviewer or reader to understand the logic they are not adding any value to the code they are not benefiting anyone we need not write such comments then what should go in the comments let's find out before we jump into the coding we need to be fully clear what is required and how we are going to achieve it that is we need to be clear about our logic this helps us in communicating our logic to someone for review and the bigger benefit is that when we are writing it down we get clarity on our thoughts we also start seeing if there is any flaw if there is any shortcoming if there is any loophole in our logic we can correct that and after we have described the logic got it reviewed and we are convinced that our logic is clear we can start writing the code as per the logic and that way when we are coding our focus is on writing a good and optimized code and once we have written the code and we think now our code itself is good it is self explanatory then what we can do is we can remove our earlier comments if required let's try to understand it through an example now let's take this example on the left hand side here we have just described the logic of our required function to check whether the given number is a prime number or not so just for this discussion purpose i am taking this simple example it can be some complex example as well now coming to the right hand side this second function 
After writing the comments describing the logic, we can write the code as per the logic. Such comments help us when we are coding and they guide us not to make any mistake. Right? Now let's continue our discussion on what type of comments we should not use. As we already discussed that we need to avoid the redundant comments or noise. The comments which are repeating what the code says, they are redundant comments. Second, we need to avoid the comments which are not matching with the code. If the comments and code are out of sync, then it will just confuse the reader, nothing else. If you are the code reader, remember that the code is the ultimate truth. Don't just rely upon the comments, they may not be in sync. Third, we need to avoid the change log type of comments. You may have seen this kind of change log comments in some of your code files. However, this information is more for the configuration management and not for coding. Therefore, the right place to have this information is the configuration management system. For example, git, svn or clear case. Another aspect about coding is that we should prefer talking through the code instead of comments. Let's consider this example. It is calculating the pension for a person given his age and number of years he has served. In this example, there are three cases for calculating the pension for which we have used these three if conditions. Now, first condition is for normal retirement. Second condition is for voluntary retirement and third condition is for very early voluntary retirement. Since from the if condition it is not clear which particular if condition is for which particular case, we are using the comments. We are taking the help from comments to describe our conditions. However, such comments are also not good. Why? For this, let us consider the next example which tries to achieve the same objective. Now in this example, as you can see, the three if conditions in the original function, they have been replaced by three functions. Right? So using these functions, it is very clear which if condition is for which particular case. So it is strongly recommended that we should try to talk through the code instead of comments wherever possible. We can use some functions or some temporary local variables for that. Another important point about the comments is that we should avoid having the old or temporary code in the comments. Sometimes what happens is when we update a code we leave behind the old code in the comments and with time it becomes very difficult to maintain such code or such comments. Right? Because the new programmer does not know why this particular code is hanging around in the comments. It is better to remove the comment which we do not require, be it the old code or some temporary code. No need of using the comments for that. Anyway, the old code is present in the older version of the file. If at any point in time it gets required, we can fetch it from there. Comments are not the good place for storing the old code. Now finally the question is, what type of comments are good comments? There are multiple ones. First is the necessary comments, that is the legal comments. For example, copyright information. For some organizations, it is mandatory to include the copyright information in the source code. Software is the company's product. So we have to have this information as comments in our files. And second, sometimes we have to write code or some values in our program which are on the basis of some discussion we had with the stakeholders or based upon our observations while testing. If it is the case, then it is better to write down in the comments so that it gets into the record 
why such code or values were written or selected and third candidate for the good comments are the warning comments if a particular piece of code is tightly coupled with some other information or with some other piece of code and you want to inform the reader that if she updates this particular piece then the other piece also has to be updated such warnings or information for the reader can be placed in the comments and final type of good comments are to do comments if you are leaving some code piece to be written later then it is good to leave behind a to do comment for that later you can search for such comments and you will get to know what was left behind earlier so that you can complete it now so i hope with this you get a good understanding how to make use of comments in your program thank you and see you in the next chapter hi again in this chapter i am going to discuss very small but very important point related to the readability of your program let's try to understand this by an example first let's take this example where we have written the main function and one function to calculate the difference of the simple interest and compound interest if you notice although this program is logically correct it is calculating the correct answer but this particular program is somewhat difficult to read because there is no space used here if you are writing some paragraphs let's say in english language you are writing some essay or some notes you do not specify all the words without any space you make some paragraphs and then you separate these paragraphs using some spaces some blank lines right so similar is the case with your program if you want to make your program much readable then you should use these spaces quite extensively wherever possible you should use that that should increase the readability of your program let's see the same programs in a different way where the spacing have been used here you see that this particular program is much readable if you notice there is a space on either side of operator every time be it assignment operator be it multiplication operator or be it addition operator so every time you are using some operator try to give some space on either side of the operator it increases the readability second thing is if you notice these two statements in this function they are calculating the simple interest and compound interest then in the second step we try to calculate the difference between the simple interest and compound interest and finally we return the difference so these are three logical steps in your function so why not try to divide these logical steps by using some blank lines it doesn't cost much but it it increases the readability of your program to a great extent similarly in the main program we have tried to use this concept if you notice here these three statements are actually the input to your program where we have specified the values being assigned to different variables and then in the second step we are using the function diff interest to calculate the difference between simple interest and compound interest and finally this third statement is actually the output statement so these three are input statement this particular statement is related to the calculation is actually the logic of your program and third one is the output of the program because these are three different blocks in your program so we have just separated these three blocks by using these two blank lines just to sum up using these blank lines and the spaces on either side of the operator you can very well increase the readability of your program which in turn will enhance the maintainability these are very small concepts but these are very much powerful i personally have received these comments from my seniors and then only i got to know the importance of this so just sharing my own experience with you that if you use these you can also increase the lifetime of your software product so with this thank you for your time in this chapter see you in the next one thank you hi in this chapter what i want to say is that we should avoid using magic numbers in our program 
whenever we require some constants in our program we should give it a specific name some meaningful name let me try to get to this point by an example for example uh, consider this particular program this is a very simple function to calculate the area of circle and as we can see that it is uh, returning 22 by 7 into radius into radius what does this 22 by 7 stands for if we know the formula for calculating the area of circle we know that it is pi r square and this 22 by 7 is actually the value of pi if we are writing this kind of function then what we need to do is just specify a constant say pi and give it the value 22 by 7 and then you can of course use this return pi into radius square just by using this particular variable or constant we are clear that this 22 by 7 value is actually belonging to the constant pi we are denoting pi as value 22 by 7 so always take care of this thing that whenever you need some value absolute value in your program some constant in your program then try to give it a meaningful name wherever possible this makes your program more readable and more maintainable so this is just a small point which I want you to discuss in this chapter. See you in the next one. Thank you.